This is Curious Incident, a podcast for special needs families and your window into the world of special education. Parenting can be challenging, and we want to make it easier by providing you with the resources you need to best help your child. Let's delve deep into the world of special education with your host, Adam Dion. I am very excited to present my next guest on this podcast. Today, I am speaking with Elisa Schrem. Elisa is the school principal at Imagine Academy, a school for children with autism and other developmental disabilities in Brooklyn, New York. She has been working with students with autism since 2003. In 2006, Elisa began working at Imagine Academy as a speech-language pathologist. In 2008, she became the interim principal, and in 2009, she began working as the school principal, which remains her current role. As school principal, Elisa is responsible for the day-to-day operations of the program, including supervising staff, conducting classroom observations, nurturing relationships with community partners, and reviewing research and development in the field of autism. Elisa, welcome to the program. It's great to he- have you here with us today. Let me do that last part again. Elisa, welcome to the program. It's great to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here today. I'm, I'm pleased that you asked me to do this. Happy to do so. So let's get started. Um, let's clarify why you're here. Can you tell us a little bit about what makes you an authority on the subject of special education? So I would say two main things make me an authority. Um, One, the students have made me an authority. Um, They've put their trust in me to educate them, and I've learned from them, and I continue to learn from them every day. And I would say along with the students, of course, their parents. And my years of experience in the field and my dedication to continuing my own education and, as you mentioned before, the research and really staying current on everything that's happening and available for my students. I'd like to pick up on something that you said. You mentioned learning from your students. Um, You've been doing this for a long time. I'm sure you've educated many, many students. I know you have. Tell us a little bit more about that. How have you learned from your students in the process of educating them? So with every student that I meet, they bring something new to the table for me. And I begin to think in different ways because I have to analyze why they may be presenting with certain um, signs, symptoms, behaviors, um, communication deficits, and always trying to figure out for that individual child how to do things. And so that might be very vastly different than how we've done things for somebody else. So with each child that I meet, it's about going deep into their profile and learning new ways to do things. That's great. You have a background in speech and language pathology. How has your speech language pathology background informed your role as school principal and informed how you view special education and autism? It has definitely made a great impact. I think as a school administrator with a clinical degree, it's just a completely different lens that we approach the job with. Um, My background is not in management. My background is in kids and being a clinician. So that's what I bring to the table in terms of um, how to run a school. In terms of being a speech pathologist, I would say it's a main focus of, um, of our program because that's one of the major deficits um, for a student with autism. So having um, communication first and foremost on my mind is really something that drives our program. Let's talk more about communication deficits. I know you have students in your school with a wide range of needs. What types of communication deficits do you typically see? That's a great question. So the first and the hardest would be a student who doesn't really want to communicate. So how do we get somebody who is locked into their own world wanting to communicate with us. So that would be your most severe case of a communication deficit. 
Then you have students who may be nonverbal um, who can learn to use a device or a picture system and they are wanting to communicate. So you don't have to work so much on communication intent, but just building a system that's going to be reliable and consistent for them. And then you have students who are verbal at different levels. They may need support in creating messages, um, grammar, uh, just putting things together, expanding their vocabulary, um, using um, more of the words that they have receptively, um, expressively in their day-to-day -day conversations. So those are the different levels I would identify. Great. For a parent, receiving an autism diagnosis for their child can be scary. Parents must come to you at all different stages, and I'd like to run through a few different scenarios with you. Okay. First, what do you say to parents who are noticing red flags but have not yet identified an issue or received an autism diagnosis or a diagnosis for some other developmental disability? So those are usually the parents of younger students. And the first thing I would always recommend is that the family does a comprehensive evaluation. And I try to recommend also some places that I think will do a good job on the evaluation. And that could be difficult in itself because it can be a very costly process for a family. I also start thinking in terms of what services um, even without the evaluation that the child is getting right now or not getting right now and maybe what we can put in place in the interim so that we're not wasting time because an evaluation does take time. I also look at where the child is in terms of schooling and what we can do again in, in the short term as far as making sure they're in a supportive educational environment. So you mentioned evaluation. You mentioned services currently being provided. You mentioned current schooling. What other sorts of questions are you asking families who come to you at this stage to assess what's going on with them, what they need to be doing? So we, we get a lot of calls weekly, daily sometimes. Um, and parents are feeling that okay, Imagine is a one-to-one -one program, and you know I want my child to have one-to-one -one services, but it's not appropriate for every child. And so we have to ask a series of questions to kind of focus and pinpoint where their child might be in terms of on the spectrum or the level of developmental disability, and then make a decision, a determination on the phone about whether we want to continue the conversation, maybe have the family come in, or am I going to refer them to another program? So some of the things I'm going to ask is, um, how is the child communicating? Um, how are they telling you um, that they want something or they need something? Um, is, the is the child toilet trained? Are they playing with toys? Are they um, interacting with um, their siblings? And you as the parent, um, are they interested in people? So these are some of like the basic questions that I'm going to ask to determine just from a very wide perspective where this child might be holding developmentally. Makes a lot of sense. You mentioned one-to-one -one instruction and or services, and I guess this is as good a time as any to define that. What do you mean when you say one-to-one -one instruction or services? So one-to-one -one for us might look different than, a, than another program one-to-one, -one. so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain how we do one-to-one -one at Imagine. Our feeling is that we don't want a child one-to-one -one all day with the same person. They become very dependent on that person. I don't think that's a good long-term plan. Um, we do one-to-one -one that the child comes into the school and throughout their day, they are always one-to-one, -one, but with different professionals. So classroom staff, related service providers, um, which could be OTs, PTs, speech pathologists, um, the classroom teacher, of course, and the classroom instructors, mental health services. So there's a team. There's a team assigned to every child, and that child is going to be with those different team members throughout the day. But the idea of needing this one-to-one -one is that 
this child is not going to be able to function and not just function, but learn and gain new skills in an environment that is not with constant support for that learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, scenario number two. Okay. Parents have just received an autism diagnosis. They're coming to you to try to figure out next steps. What do you say to them? The first thing I'm going to say is to please, of course, send me all their reports that they've received from that evaluation. And I'm I'm going to look it over really carefully. I'm also going to ask them if their child is currently in a school program, what the professionals are recommending that are already working with that child. And I think that's very often overlooked. Um, let's look at the people that know that child right now and what are they feeling is an appropriate next step. Um, if I feel it is warranted, then I would bring them in for a tour and a dialogue and we would go deeper in terms of the conversation. If after reading a report, I don't feel like Imagine is the right school, I'm going to open up my school list. I am very versed in all the special education programs in the New York City tri-state area. And I'm going to make some recommendations about where I think they should try and reach out to and maybe um, you know, set up some tours with those schools that might be a more appropriate match. And what are some things that you would want to know from the instructors and providers who are working with the student currently? The, the number one thing that I want to know from them is where they're recommending. Where do they see that child? Because often we're talking about a child who's in a special education preschool and or in early intervention could be as well and so those providers that are coming into the house or seeing that child on a weekly daily basis are going to have some sort of feeling about where they feel um, that child could be functioning do they see that child in an 8 or a 12 or an integrated you know we want some feedback from those professionals does your advice to these families differ depending on whether they're coming out of, whether the student is coming out of early intervention versus preschool versus a school age program? Yes, it would depend greatly on what educational services the child has already received. Can you expand on that a little bit? How does it affect your decision making or advice giving process? For some of the students that come out of the special education preschools, um, I don't feel like they've necessarily received intensive enough services. So I'm going to lean more towards this child might need more one-to-one -one in the short term to get them going because I want to really make sure that they can function in a less restrictive environment. For a family that comes from a public school or a less restrictive environment and the child has not been successful, that would also warrant a different conversation of why hasn't that child been successful or were the right services provided and maybe they do need a more intense approach to get them moving and get them really learning and, and making progress on their goals. All right, so let's segue into scenario number three. What do you say to parents who received an autism diagnosis a while ago, let's say several years ago, but there haven't been any improvements. So again, I'm going to look at the education system that the child is in and make a determination of whether or not that program is meeting the needs or at least has the, um, the structure in place that would be appropriate for that level of that child. If the child is still not making progress, then I may say it's time for a reevaluation to see that perhaps something was overlooked. Um, and we have to look at body systems. Um, it could be anxiety. There could be some medical thing that was overlooked. So we really have to step back and say, why isn't this child performing, especially if I feel that they have been placed in a good educational setting? And from your perspective, how do those uh, other points you mentioned factor in? Uh, body, motor, anxiety, how does that fit into the picture? 
it fits in that it could be the thing that derails somebody from their ability to progress. If a child is not sleeping through the night, and I've worked with some good sleep specialists, that's the first suggestion I'm going to make to a family. Well, if your child's not sleeping through the night, if they're only eating, you know, two foods, then these are things that are not going to help them get through their day and be able to learn and focus. And that's that's something that we see a lot in kids with autism. Sleep deprivation, um, uh, nutritional issues, and, it, and if we're not taking care of those things, then it's really hard to make progress. Uh, I can only, uh, I know how I function on a poor night's sleep. I can't even imagine what it must be like for a youngster who's, dealing with the kinds of issues we're talking about and is not getting the right kind of sleep or having the right diet or things of that nature. Exactly. And sometimes there are medical issues that go unchecked. Um, so we work with some good, uh, you know, gastro specialists and definitely uh, mental health is a very core component I would say the highest comorbid diagnosis with autism is anxiety disorder. And that could be something that really derails a student. Um, and then aside from all those things, maybe the educational setting is not a good match for that child. And sometimes just changing schools and having a new approach could mean a world of difference. And that's why identifying the appropriate placement is so important. It's key. Finally, scenario number four. What do you say to parents who received an autism diagnosis a while ago and there has been some progress but not really meaningful progress? I think it depends on how we define progress. I think there are students who come through our program that fly. You know, they're, they're meeting their goals. We, we can't write new goals fast enough. They're just really taking to the program. And then you have other students who are more, you're slow and steady, and that's great. And then you have students that really make minimal progress despite every resource that you're throwing at them. And so then you have to go back to the drawing table and say, what else can we do? Or is there another program that might meet this child's needs better than we can at this point? And so you have to be honest as an educator because that's your client, that child, and you want to do the best that you can possibly do. But sometimes there are other mitigating factors that get in the way, um, sometimes severe behaviors. Um, we may meet with the neurologist or the um, psychologist, psychiatrist on the team and talk about medication management. Is this child under-medicated? Is this child over-medicated? And these things really play a part. On the subject of behaviors, what types of behaviors do you normally see in your population? everything. <laughs> There's no behavior I think I haven't seen from something very innocuous um, that's not really um, harming anybody but can be a detractor to learning to your most severe behaviors of severe aggression to others, um, to the staff, to the other children, to themselves. So biting yourself, banging your head on the floor, um, punching, um, scratching, hitting, biting, spitting. I mean, I mean, all these things are what we see in a population that has communication deficits. I can't tell you that I'm really upset right now in an appropriate manner, so I'm going to hit you, and then hopefully you'll understand what's going on with me. Mm -hmm. And so we really work very closely um, with the speech department to make sure that we have some type of a communication system in place. And it's really tricky for kids that have um, a, may have a global um, deficit. Sure. So we discussed a few scenarios before. I'm just curious, at what stage in the process do families usually come to you? I would say... 70 to 80 percent of the families that come to us are coming out of a special education preschool, so the turning five population. 
Then there is a percentage of students that are in public schools and they're very unhappy with the system. So that child might be in a six or an eight and they're not making progress. And then we do have students that come to us from other special needs programs. Okay, and when these families come to you, you must get lots of questions like, what's this going to mean for my child long term? What do you tell them? It's the most difficult question. Um, is my child going to get married? Are they going to go to college? Are they going to have a good life? You know, And I always say, we're going to provide them with the tools and the resources that we have at our disposal. But there are so many things that go along the way in the years of development that can make a child succeed or can make a child regress. And it's really hard to know sometimes when you're looking at a five-year-old who is going to be the one who is successful and who is going to encounter more difficulties along the way. So you mentioned having a good life, and I know that you view it as part of your role to help kids in your school have a good life, the best that they can have. And so how do you talk parents through that conversation? How do you help families identify what having a good life means or can mean for their specific child? I think quality of life is key. And I know that when somebody is coming to me with a five-year-old and they're thinking about reading and they're thinking about college, that it's a complete shift in, in the thinking process. And one of the ways that we really try to bring families onto our page, so to speak, is to get them into the school as much as possible and do a lot of co-treats with them at the school and just have them begin to understand that the roadmap that they may have had planned out, as every parent you know, does for their child, is going to be different. And so that we have to celebrate the things that they're doing now and the things that we're working on and that we're wanting a functioning, happy, productive, can be part of our world individual. individual. That's the most important key, not whether or not they're going to be able to go to college. And that's, it's a huge shift for a lot of our parents. And look, some of our kids might go to college, but I can't know that. I can't promise that to the parent of a five-year-old. It's difficult. Sure. You mentioned the term co-treat. Can you just clarify what that means? Absolutely. So bringing parents into the school is really key. And I know it's it's hard for families because everyone has such a busy life. But um, one of the things that we do at the school is um, a methodology called DAR, Developmental Individualized Relationship-Based Therapy. It's the hardest thing that we do um, in my own personal practice. It's the hardest thing to do. Um, we want the families to come in and learn how to do this type of methodology with their child. Uh, it's, it's also known as floor time, so we'll call it floor time. Um, really just getting into their child's world and interacting with them at a basic level at first and then moving up from there. And sometimes those can be the real celebratory moments. So for a mom who hasn't had um, good reciprocal play with her child and now comes into the school and we're coaching and we're all in it together. We're all on the floor. We're in it together. That parent becomes part of our team and the child starts to interact with the mom maybe in a new, in a new way that they never did before. It's a real triumph. It's a real moment of celebration for the family. It's hope for the future that I can expand now these interactions and build. That's the whole cornerstone of the, the philosophy of this play technique um, to get more interaction. That's really, really wonderful. That's really wonderful. And I think sometimes we need reminders to celebrate the accomplishments. And I think for parents to have that opportunity to come into the school and work with the professionals in the school at the same time that they're working with their child in a play-based way to meet their child where the child is, you know, on that level, um, that sounds like a wonderful opportunity to uh, establish connection and engagement. 
We also go into the house um, and we do play with the siblings are really important and never should be overlooked. I know there's been a lot of research that, you know, shows that, you know, if we if we ignore or overstep, you know, the siblings, that that has a very negative downstream effect. And as somebody who in my private practice goes into homes, I'm always looking to bring the siblings into the play, um, not all the time, but a portion of the time so that we make sure that we're working with a family system, we're working with the parents, we're working with everybody in the home. Um, Anybody who's with that child needs to be part of that play routine with us and really learn how to interact. And it's about also showing our support for the family that we're we're there with them. Um, we're standing next to them, not across from them. I think that might be a good segue. I was going to ask you, what do you consider a positive outcome, right? And I realize that may be different for different families, um, and there might be various components, but what do you consider a positive outcome? For me, a positive outcome would be that this child is available and appropriate to go out into the community and do work activities and recreational activities. They're happy. They enjoy their life. Um, Their leveling of anxiety is on the lower side or we've managed it to be on the lower side. They're able to express some of their thoughts and feelings And in general, they feel good about themselves and they are productive in their lives. That's great. I so my next question for you before I launch into it, I want to ask you to define a phrase that as part of my question, I think may come up later in our conversation. And that's less restrictive, right? Usually gets used in the context of less restrictive environment or less restrictive setting. Can you just briefly explain what that means? Absolutely. And I think there's been so much emphasis on the less restrictive and that's like the the golden ticket. It's, you know, what everyone's striving for. And sometimes it is a great thing to strive for. And we are certainly pushing some of our students towards a less restrictive environment, but it's not right for every student. Um, and what it means is that we're going to have them in a less supportive um, placement than they're currently in. So imagine it is considered a more restrictive environment. It's one-to-one. And so, um, you know, parents will come in and I would say this question is almost asked on every tour I've ever done is, can my child mainstream after this program? And my answer is always the same. The goal is not to mainstream. The goal is to go to a less restrictive environment if that's appropriate, but we certainly don't want to give a high level of support and then remove all of that support and say, you know, kind of like, good luck and let's see how you do. It's not an experiment, it's a person. And so we want to give the right level of support. And we also want to pull back the support when it's not needed. And being in a one-to-one program, we can pull back support. It's no problem. In light of what you just said, that you're able to pull back support as needed. How do you create opportunities for less restrictive or uh, less supportive settings within your school setting? I mean, certainly pulling back support is one example. Maybe you can discuss that a little bit further and share if there are any other ways that you accomplish that. Absolutely. And it definitely becomes a focus as our students get older. And I have visited a lot of the post-21 programs and I have seen what life is like on the other side. And there is no one-to-one support after 21. And so we need to really prepare our students. So here's, here's some examples. That you can go to the store with two peers and one teacher and complete your shopping list or do whatever it is you need to do or you're going to go to a vocational site with only one instructor and two other students and be able to perform and be able to function. So that would be an example. Um, As our students get older and we judge it appropriate, um, another thing that we do is we give our students hall passes and we have them transition through the building independently. We want them to feel... um, 
as independent as possible and have faith in themselves that they can do that and not be worried that they're going to get lost in the building. And so we start out small, of course, but always building towards independence. Um, we've actually done some programs where we may have a staff member wait outside of a store. And this would have been a practice routine. You know, we're very careful in how we do things and have the student go in themselves and perform the task. And so we're monitoring and we're there. And maybe we've even called the store in advance and let them know. We have some good community partners. And um, that would be a way to lessen support, but be there if needed. That's super important, and I think it's in line with what you said before about generalizing skills, right? Students, particularly students with autism, need the opportunity to practice their skills in different environments, and so they may learn one way in the classroom. They may even learn one way in the classroom with a particular teacher, but it might be different with a different teacher in that same classroom, and it certainly could be different in a different setting, such as a supermarket or a restaurant or, or any community setting, such as the ones you've mentioned. Absolutely. Do you have any anecdotes of students you've worked with that you can share to make this journey a little bit more concrete for our listeners? So in thinking about some individual profiles, um, I can think of a student who came to us. He came to us from a public school, and he had not learned to read. And he was, I don't know his exact age, I want to say around 10. And I'm sure they had used many different reading programs at that point, and still he wasn't learning to read. And um, he came to Imagine, and we were able to teach him how to read. And that was a huge turning point in his life because if you can read, vocational opportunities open up and you can understand your world a lot better. You can use literacy as a tool for learning. You can write, you can type, you can do so many different things. He ended up getting to the point that we were able to create a hybrid program for him. And this was, of course, before COVID, where he spent half of, his, half of his day with us and half of his day in a less restrictive school. Unfortunately, with COVID, we couldn't continue it for now because we didn't want to mix germ pools. But um, that's something that we're hoping we could maybe pick up again for next year. But that, to me, is a real success story. You went from being you know, uh, making no progress in your academic skills to being able to go to a less restrictive environment and be able to do all these things in the community that we weren't sure were going to be possible um, when we first met him. And I think offering a hybrid program of that nature speaks volumes about a school's ability to customize the program based on the individual student's needs, right? So you may be in a program where you're receiving one-to-one -one instruction or services the entire day, um, but then be able to transition to spending part of your day somewhere else in a less supportive setting where you're going to be exposed to different types of students and have opportunities to make different mental connections and practice skills in a different way, which in my experience as a legal practitioner, can do wonders for the student's progress. Absolutely. We were very fortunate to partner with a good team all the way around. So his legal team really supported the initiative, and the other school really worked very well together with us. Um, there was a lot of logistical things that needed to be ironed out in order for it to work. So we were very, very fortunate to have a good team. Any other anecdotes that you would feel comfortable sharing? You know, as much as I try to keep this program not technical, um, you know, there is still some information that can be hard to grasp. And I find that parents really connect with stories that make it more concrete. Anything else that comes to mind? I'm thinking of another little boy who came to us. Um, he was a turning five. His mother carried him into the school because he couldn't walk. Um, so she needed to carry him in for the intake, and we met with him, and he had a whole host of medical issues and was non-ambulatory. 
and um, that's not our really our primary um, profile of student but I felt that for this particular boy we were going to be the right placement because we had everything in place that he needed and so um, we did end up accepting him into the program he is now walking he was actually just voted president um, we had some elections in the school he's talking um, beautifully he is doing academics he is learning to read he will always need one-to-one -one support in his learning maybe not at the level that he's receiving right now um, he's about nine now and I can see that support diminishing over time, but I don't necessarily see him as a student that would go to a less restrictive environment. I'm not sure what that would do for him in terms of meeting goals and learning new skills. So for him, for me, he's a real success story, and yet he's a child that is staying in our program. So it's again, how are we measuring success? Obviously, the family is beyond delighted with the progress that he's made, and they're not looking to take him out. Their feeling would be, he's doing great here, so why would I want to remove him from that? So that's just another trajectory. That's great. Thank you for sharing those stories. So you must get lots of questions from parents about what they can be doing to help their children outside of school, and I'm sure parents have concerns. Uh, I know, uh, you know, from my own experience that I've seen parents have these types of concerns about, you know, going places with their children or potential outbursts that may occur. Travel um, and commuting is a big concern for a lot of parents and overall safety, right, in daily living. So how do you respond to parents who bring those concerns to your attention? So the first thing I want to do is get a profile or a workup of what's happening after school. Is the child receiving any services at home after school? Is that something that we're going to recommend? Or do we want to have some more recreational opportunities? So it really depends on the child, on the student. Um, for our younger students, I tend to recommend more ABA and intensive learning for after school. As the students get older, I really want to shift to more naturalistic recreational types of um, activities after school because it just becomes too much. They're getting enough during the day that they don't necessarily need all of that after school. So joining a karate class or a dance class or going to a local community center to do some, some workout programs and making sure that the family has support through ComHab or ResHab, which is different programs through um, the city that you can get to have staffing. Um, Another thing is that I always I always use um, the Greenspan. Dr. Greenspan used to say, if you have um, less than a 70% chance of success at something, that you probably shouldn't do it. So if we're going to go to the restaurant and there's going to be a, a high likelihood that the child's going to have a meltdown, it's probably not something we should do. It is something the school needs to know because we've actually done restaurant programs with kids where we'll say to the family, tell us, you know, what's your favorite restaurant to go to? And we'll go in there and we'll actually practice that in a very systematic way. And then hopefully it does transfer to when the child is then going to do that with their family. But then you have more complicated situations like getting on an airplane. And I wish I could practice that with the kids, but it's really not feasible. Um, if they're not going to be successful, then I'm probably going to say, let's hold off on that at this time. However, if we can put certain supports in place and we think there's a chance, a good high chance of success, then I'm going to push the family to try to reach out and do that. Because what we don't want to, we don't want to limit the world of the child. And as kids develop and either behaviors and anxiety improve or things go in the other direction, which does happen sometimes, the world can either get bigger can, or it can shrink. And so we don't want the world to shrink. We want the students to be able to go to restaurants and community centers and the park and get on an airplane and go down to Disneyland or whatever it is that you're wanting to do as a family. And so 
we want to make sure that those opportunities are given. And I always tell parents, start small and start supportively. You know, um, what's doable right now? Can we put the child in the wagon and run through Target for 10 minutes and just see how they do? Maybe that's a good first step. Or just walking to your local candy store and let's go in and can we be successful by something and come out without having a meltdown and then kind of build from there. But I think it's really important for the special needs community to um, to explore everything that the neurotypical kids have access to. So zoos and museums and parks and overnights and whatever you can think of, you know, if you if you can expose your child to that, then you're on the right track. And I'm hearing or understanding that they should be doing so, parents should be doing so from as early an age as possible, right? In bite-sized pieces to start introducing their children to those types of settings? Absolutely. And when we, when there are school breaks coming up, we send out lists of places that we suggest trying. Um, and sometimes pa- other parents, you know, send to us information that we know um, – other families have been successful at and we think are maybe just more open to having special needs come in. Excellent. Makes a lot of sense. What role does community involvement and vocational programming play for families you deal with? I think you've spoken about community involvement a little bit already. You can add anything else that you'd like to add on that subject. But then there's also vocational programming, which I think is an important topic as well. So the community partners are really important to foster, be it other schools, be it local community centers, um, any, any stores in the community, anything that you could identify that the students can go out of the building and do things in is, is amazing. Um, vocational is probably the hardest. Um, it's very hard to get consistent vocational partners because as business change and as needs change from these vocational partners, sometimes there's not work available. And the consistency for my students is really important. So sometimes we're sort of home growing our own, um, our own programs and making our own opportunities for things like we've done delivery programs and you know, offered services at the school. We just launched um, a mentorship program with a local school where they're coming in and our students are helping them do um, uh, bears, uh, you know, like it's like a Build-A-Bear type of thing. And so we prepped with our students all the steps necessary in what they're going to do when the students came in. So we practiced all of that. And then when the students came, it actually worked out really well. And I'm always hopeful that, you know, we can keep expanding that to more vocational opportunities. But I find the things that we home grow are our best um, vocational opportunities. Right. I, I hate to say it, but I think as a country, we're behind when it comes to vocational programming. Um, we're doing a disservice to our kids um, by not having more programs, uh, more job opportunities available to students with special needs. Um, and that's unfortunate, but I'd like to think that it's going to get better in the future. When, you know, as school principal, as the person running the show, at what point do you start thinking about those opportunities for your students? It's a great question. Um, but just to touch on something that you said, I want my students to do more than pack groceries. They can do more than just bag groceries at the local supermarket. And that's that's the level that's currently offered, you know. And I agree with you 100%. We need to find and create more offerings. Um, the second part of your question in terms right. of... At what uh, point do you start thinking about vocational yes. opportunities for your students? So, again, it's going to depend on the students. Some students will stay in heavy academics longer because we know that once they leave us they don't have those academic activities um, available to them so I might keep a student who's performing very high in academics heavy in that until even 18 19 and not cross them over so early for a student that is not as successful perhaps in academics and will do better 
with the vocational activities. I might cross them over earlier. So even at 12, I'm definitely um, thinking about that and creating some prerequisite programs for them to start working on. If you had to sum up your mission and vision for individuals with autism, how would you describe it? Ooh, <laughs> it's a big question. Um, my mission is to help them obtain the best life that they can have and work collaboratively with the family. Um, if I work with just the student and I don't bring the family into the mix, then I haven't been successful. So I want to create a stable family environment that we're all focused on what is the trajectory for this child and, and how do we get to those next steps and really working together um, with them. In terms of the overall mission, um, just broadening the scope of what's available um, one of my dreams is to um, have some type of vocational open to the community at large to come and my students would run it. I mean, that would be like my dream in life, you know, um, to be able to do that. But it's really hard to get to that step. There's a lot of um, obstacles in the way, but that's it's on my life list. <laughs> I think that's an amazing dream. I love it. And I, I have someone you need to speak with on that subject. We can discuss further offline. Fantastic. Um, tell me a little bit about, tell our listeners a little bit about how the home component, right? Where does that fit in to your mission and vision? You mentioned before that you sometimes go into the home. We've talked about generalizing skills. How does the home component fit in here? The more we partner with the home, the more the parents see us as their teammates, the better the child is going to do. Um, and so for some families, it's a dream because that's what they're looking for. And it's definitely one of the main questions that I will ask during an intake. You know, what, what do you see as your level of participation? And some families um, really follow through on that. And, you know, we're certainly making the offerings and beating down the doors. Other families, it's just more difficult. They may have more on their plate. If we're talking about a single mom who has three special needs children, it's going to be hard, right? But um, the better we partner, the more we understand the needs of the family, the more they understand what we have to offer some families really come in and I say like they're working our program, right? They're calling, they're coming, they're setting up the home visits, they're setting up the visits with our staff, they're coming in for the co-treats, they're working the program. Those are the students that are going to do better because the parent is the driving force. And it's a shift for a lot of our families because you know, they're warriors, right? That they had to find a school and they had to fight to get, you know, X, Y, and Z services. But then there comes a time when you have to put down that warrior shield and now refocus on to being a warrior for your child in a different way. And that really means rolling up your sleeves and getting in on the learning piece. So there's, there's a really big shift there that needs to happen. That's really important. So we've talked about ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis. We've talked about DIR floor time. Um, tell us a little bit more about how you help the students in your school, a little bit more about your educational model in a nutshell. So I think for some students, the ABA is really key. If they're coming in and they don't have